the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you With new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Blind Bet. Tom Brayton stood quietly in the darkness in a corner near one of the cabanas, hidden from the open courtyard by a screen of shrubbery and palm trees. The luminous dial of his wristwatch told him it was 11.15, but he hadn't long to wait. He looked with satisfaction on the courtyard and fountain, down the long line of cabanas past the huge, brilliant Casino del Rey, rising like a fairy castle in the desert. The finest, the costliest, the most luxurious gambling resort in the country. And all of it, the music, the glitter, the throngs of well-heeled socialites, a tribute to him. A monument to the patient, calculating gambler's mind that brought this all to pass on a barren alkali flat. Suddenly he stiffened. Two men were coming down the steps of the casino, one of them very drunk, the other helping him. Tom held his breath as they moved nearer. Hey, the old boy, don't get me wrong. You're the best little bartender in the land. It's just that I object to these high-handed... I'm sorry, Mr. Warren. I'm just following Mr. Braden's orders. He said to put you to bed, and that's where you're going. Uh, But I don't want to go to bed, don't you see? I want to go back to the casino. Yeah, I know, sir, but Mr. Braden... Never mind, Mr. Braden. Did it ever occur to you, old man, that Mr. Braden owns exactly one half of this place? That I own the other half? Listen, don't you see, Mr. Warren? He's afraid that in your condition you'll make a bad impression on the guest. <laughs> He's afraid I'll make a bad impression. Sure. Now, that's funny. That's very, very funny. Tom Braden, Garjack. Afraid I'll make a bad impression on the guest. Yes, sir. Uh, here, here, let me open the door for you. Uh, now, this one. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Now, yeah. maybe you don't know that I picked this Tom Braden up in a rigged house, a clip joint where he was dealing blackjack. Uh, he was not. Sure, I yeah. took him to the right people. I made his connections for him. I... Yes, I know. Come now, on, let now. me Where's finish. I... Let me finish. Oh, I found the money for him, too. A half a million bucks cash on the baronet. Hazel Symington didn't know him from Adam. I took him to her. I spoke the good word and bingo. She comes through with 500,000 bucks, just like that. Yes, yeah, sure, I know. You know what? What? Now he wants it all. What do you think of that? I think you better go to bed. Now, come on, Mr. Uh, Warren, please. Uh, I... You don't believe me, do you? Oh, yes, You I... don't believe he wants it all now? Oh, no. Don't matter. He... He's not going to get it anyway. Not with that half million dollar note coming up next week. Listen, will you please get inside uh, and get sure, to bed? Now, come sure on, will you? Hey, I'll go to bed. All right, come on. Well, Tom, your partner's speaking is Pete again. Same song, 87th verse. You smile to yourself and continue to wait there in the darkness. Finally, you see Ed leave and walk back up to the bar. You stand there for five minutes longer, just for good measure. And then walk quietly up to the door, whip a silk handkerchief from your breast pocket, place it over the knob, and let yourself in with your pass key. You flick your cigarette light. <sighs> Just as you thought. John Warren is dead to the world, lying on the bed fully clothed. Remarkable what a couple of knockout drops will do, isn't it, Tom? Quickly, you move around the room, 
Make sure all the windows are closed tightly. Then over to the gas heater in the fireplace. Once again, the silk handkerchief over the valve. Ah, there. John Warren was right, wasn't he, Tom? You do want it all. With the prologue of The Blind Bet, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Let me see. One, two, three, five, nine. Just nine more days before your Fourth of July holiday. For most folks with cars, that means a trip somewhere, to the mountains or to the beach. But for too many folks, it's also going to mean accidents. Accidents that could have been avoided by an ounce of prevention. Here's what I mean. Traffic deaths in April were 47% higher than a year ago. One big reason is that today's aging cars are wearing out. In the recent police traffic check program, one out of every three cars inspected had either defective brakes, tires, lights, horn, or windshield wiper. Little parts that cost so little to fix, but can cause such big accidents. So play safe. Stop by your signal dealers to have your car checked over. Caring for your car is his business, and you'll find your signal dealer is prepared to serve you in many ways. He can repair that tire with the weak spot. Or retread the one that's worn smooth. He'll replace that worn-out fan belt, radiator hose, or windshield wiper. Or put a new bulb in that burned-out stoplight. But take a tip. See your signal dealer this week before the last-minute rush. Then, when the 4th of July arrives, you'll know your car is ready for a safe and happy holiday. And now, back to the whistler. You do want all the money. It took the three of you to build the Casino Del Rey. John Warren's socialite friend. Mrs. Symington's money and your brain. And now you've got to have it all. You stand there at the bar, calmly talking to Ed, the bartender, while John Warren lies dying in his cabana. Like every decision you ever made, it was a matter of odds, wasn't it, Tom? A good bet. A thousand to one, he'll be found dead in the morning victim of an unfortunate accident involving too much alcohol and a gas heater he forgot to light. So you wait there calmly until finally you see Mrs. Symington waddle into the game room and put her 200 pounds next to the poker table, pull in her cards with those fat, jewel-covered arms and begin to play. You manage to get along with her, don't you, Tom? Of course you do. After all, there's the personal note she holds against you for a half million coming up for renewal next week. Sorry I had to interrupt you, Hazel. Were you winning? <laughs> I'm not much of a gambler, I guess. I never bet unless I have a sure thing. You can't win that way. What's on your mind? John. Oh, I suppose he's drunk again. Well, I just had Eddie put him to bed. I think the three of us ought to have a meeting in the morning. I've talked to him till I'm blue in the face. You know, it worries me to have John jeopardize your investment. Now, look, Tommy. We talk the same language. You can lay it on the table. What do you mean? You were dealing a two-bit blackjack game when John Warren introduced us. And when my late lamented husband married me, I was a hash slinger. So you don't need John anymore, eh? I want to get rid of him. Matter, Tom? You like the idea? Well, it's pretty rough. Oh? You mean you think that we can... Well, I mean you can stuff his pockets with money and put him on a plane. Send him to Havana or Honolulu. Time he gets back, you can buy him out. Oh... What did you think I meant? Oh, uh, just that. I wonder. Hmm? Nothing. You better run along. Here comes my good friend, Dr. Latham. Okay, we'll meet tomorrow, huh? Well, if you want to. Oh, by the way, don't worry about that note. I'm in no hurry for the money. Of course not, Hazel. You know I'm not the worrying kind. So Hazel goes back to the game with Dr. Latham. Disgusting, isn't it, Tom? Latham, 25 years her junior, fawning, flattering, fearful that the life she's leading will kill her before he marries her. That's odd, isn't it? Both in the same boat. 
You're afraid something will happen to her, too, before you get your hands on that note. You walk up to your apartment over the casino, sit there in the silence at your desk, idly shuffling a pack of cards, thinking. It was a good bet, and you're improving your hand all the time. Eddie, the bartender, was the last man to see John alive. No one saw you leave or come back to the casino. Hazel will testify you expected to meet John in the morning. Yes, Tom, it's a good bet. Come in. Oh, Dr. Latham. Thought I might have a word with you, Mr. Braden. Sure, how much do you want? Do you always think in terms of money? Of course, so do you. I wanted to talk to you about Mrs. Symington. Well, she inherited about $30 million, but I don't know how much she has left. I am not interested in Mrs. Symington's money. Of course you're not. It's a beautiful soul that attracts you. Come on, Doc, come to the point. I happen to know we cleaned you the first night you were here that Mrs. Symington has been staking you regularly and that if the AMA knew you were practicing in this state, they'd jerk your license. If they haven't done it already. Now, what do you want? We seem to have a mutual interest in Mrs. Symington's health. Mm-hmm. If anything happened to her, it isn't likely her financial manager would see his way clear to renew the note she holds on you. Right? What's wrong with Mrs. Symington's health? Good heavens, man. You have eyes, haven't you? She's dangerously heavy for her age. Overindulges in everything. Food, drinks, gambling, opiates. What kind of opiates? Ordinary sedatives to help her sleep. Terribly hard on her heart, nevertheless. If you knew she had heart trouble, why'd you let her have them? Because if I cut her off, she'd only buy them someplace else. I'm very much interested in Hazel, Mr. Graydon. Unfortunately, I can't say the feeling's reciprocated. Apparently, she depends on you a great deal for advice. You're a little obscure, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Braden, if you were to help me arrange, say, an alliance with Hazel... You'd I... arrange to get the note for me, is that it? Exactly. It wouldn't cost you a cent. What do you say? No. Why? Well, in the first place, she isn't stupid. Every fortune hunter in the country has been after her for years. Well, and in the second place... <laughs> you double-cross me. Good night, Doctor. <laughs> So the doctor has the idea, too, hasn't he, Tom? Something about Hazel's health. Something about her estate moving in to collect the half-million-dollar note, should anything happen to her. You know you can never pay it. They might as well ask for the moon. You knew from the first that you'd have to cross this bridge someday, just as you knew you'd have to eliminate John Warren. But this one isn't easy, is it, Tom? Somehow, some way, you have to get your hands on that note. Yes, it's something to think about. Something to keep your mind spinning all night. And then... Oh. Oh, what the devil. (laughs) Yes? Uh, Mr. Braden, this is Eddie. Oh, yes, Eddie. Uh, Mr. Warren's dead. What? He didn't answer his phone, so I went down there. I opened the door and the place was full of gas. Did you call the doctor? Latham's there now. Said Mr. Warren must have got cold during the night and got up to turn on the gas. But he was in a fog and went back to bed without lighting it. Oh. Tough, isn't it, boss? Yeah, tough. The verdict, Tom. It's all over, Hazel. The good sheriff just left. Just like that. Just like that. You're a good gambler, Tom. (laughs) You play a pretty tough hand yourself. I've got a couple of high cards... But I'm afraid I'm a little overcautious. Oh? Yes. To ban you tomorrow. I think we ought to talk about that note. Well. The last card you played was an ace. My luck. I mean, the I'm... sheriff said it was an accident. Oh, of course. The only one who might deny it is John. Oh, pardon me. Am I interrupting a post-mortem? This is no time for flippancy, Doctor. Hazel and I lost a good friend last night. I'm sorry. I should have known how deeply grieved you are. Oh, you don't look so well, Hazel. I never felt better in my life. Well, I don't think you should play tonight. Now, let's not go through that again. You're overexcited. I told you... You've been that way for months. You persist in this. If you keep up with this nonsense with sleeping tablets... I'm I... glad you mentioned that, Doctor. I'm out of sleeping tablets. Bring some over tonight, will you, please? But, Hazel, don't you understand? Hazel, I... you'd uh, better listen to her. I'm going back to dress, Doctor. I'll expect you in an hour. Well, I'll bring you one tablet. And that's all. Just one. Well, Tom, the picture has changed. You wonder what's on her mind, why she wants to talk about the note. One thing is certain, 
She must have it there with her. And it would be just like her to toss it carelessly in a dresser drawer. And there's only one way you'll ever be safe, Tom. You've got to get your hands on that note and destroy it. You're smart enough to realize that this is a good bet, too. That it'll be a long time before you're dealt another hand like this one. But it's a blind bet, Tom. And the one thing that changed the odds completely, the thing that made your whole plan so ridiculously futile, took place a few hours later in Mrs. Symington's cabana. Now, I hope you understand, Hazel. I'll leave the sedative here, but I don't want you to take it unless it's absolutely necessary. Oh, just a minute. There's my call. Yes? Ready with New York, Mrs. Symington. Hello, Mr. Pierce. Yes, Mrs. Symington. What can I do for you? I'm afraid I made a mistake, Mr. Pierce. I just found I included that Tom Braden note in those papers I mailed you last week. Uh, yes, it's due next week. Uh, did you want me to start action on it here? No, I mail it to me at once and I'll take care of it here. Uh, very well. Uh, is there anything else, Mrs. Symington? No, that's all, Mr. Pierce. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, what are you going to do? Foreclose? No. I'm going to tear it up. What? Tear up a note for a half a million? Are you crazy? I don't think so. You know, the circumstances, I'm getting off cheap. You see, Doc, I've decided that this business is a little vicious for a woman of my age. Yes, but my good woman, a half million dollars. You don't know what you're doing. And you don't know Braden. Huh. It's quite a decision. Indeed it is. I only hope I didn't make it too late. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty generous gift, Hazel. Yes. And I want him to know he's getting it. That's very important. I want him to know tonight. Yes, Tom, it was a blind bet. And it might have been off if you'd heard that conversation, if you'd known about the blind card. But you didn't until it was too late. Shortly before midnight, you see Hazel and the doctor come into the game room, but you keep your eyes on your cards. The less you say tonight, the better. Hazel is nobody's fool. I'll bet, too. Uh, uh, hello, Braden. If you don't mind, I'd like to... Doc, later. I'm busy. Well, could you excuse yourself for a moment? It's a matter of some importance. Look, if you want to cash a check, Eddie will take care of you. Now, run along, will you? I'll see you later. A little only take a minute. It's... It's about the note. Oh. Well, I, uh... I can't leave my guess. You understand that? All right, Braden. Later. <laughs> What's the matter with him? He's coming later. Can't leave his guests. Sit down. I still think you're making an awful mistake. Hazel. I know what I'm doing. You're afraid of him, aren't you? Why did you say that? I can see it in your face. Oh, you better stick to your pills. I'm not afraid of anyone. I'm serious, Hazel. You don't look very well tonight. I think you'd better go to bed early. Oh, well. Can I depend on you to tell Tom about of the note? Of course, of course. I'll walk over to your cabana. Oh, no. I'll go alone. Well, you're acting sensible for once. Remember your promise about the sleeping tablet, hmm? I won't take it unless I need it. Hmm. Here, let me help you with your wrap. Don't you worry about Braden. I'll talk to him sometime tonight. You sit there and watch them, Tom. See Hazel walk to the door and the doctor turn and come back. It was about the note, he said. And you're sure now that there could only be one reason why she'd be so anxious to talk to you about the note. She's changed her mind, of course. It's just like her. She's changed her mind and wants to call in her note. But why? Why would she do that? You know the doctor could never convince her. She has no respect for him. She must have talked to someone. Here's your ring. Just a moment. I'll connect you. Yes, sir. I'm ringing. Just a moment, please. Hello, Ellie. One moment. Oh, hello, Mr. Braden. Busy night, huh? Not so bad. Lots of uh, long-distance calls? A few. You wouldn't happen to remember who they were for, would you? Well, let's see. Uh, there was one from Chicago for Mr. Piper down in 14. Uh -huh. and one from New York for Mrs. Symington. I and, see. Uh, let me think. There was another, too. Oh, that's all right. I'm just curious. Thanks, Ellie. <laughs> That's it, Tom. You're sure now, aren't you? 
Pierce called her from New York and changed her mind about the note. Of course. She wants her money and you can't get it for her. You avoid Dr. Latham. You don't want to hear about the note. You have to be able to prove that you believed Hazel was going to renew it. That no one told you differently. That there was every reason in the world why you'd want her to live. Yes, Tom. There's only one way out now. That single sleeping tablet in Hazel's room, the one the doctor left for her, is going to be the last one she'll ever take. Oh, Eddie. Yes, Mr. Braden, can I fix you a drink? No, I'm going up to my apartment. Look, I don't want to be disturbed in any circumstances. Did you see the doctor? No. He's been after me all evening. Says he's got to see you. That it's awfully important. Well, I can't see him tonight. I got a headache. I feel rotten. I'm going to bed. Tell him that. Okay, boss. Anything you say. It's three in the morning when you use the pass key again. This time on the door of Hazel's cabana. You stop for a moment and listen. Ah, she must have taken the tablet because she's sound asleep. It's a good sleep, isn't it, Tom? Worth half a million to you. You walk quietly to the bed and pick up the extra pillow. Stand over her for a second and then... <laughs> She stopped breathing now. It's all over, Tom. You haven't too much time to find the note. Carefully now. No one must know the place has been ransacked. The silk handkerchief again. First the dresser. Out here. The nightstand, maybe. Luggage. It's in a luggage. Yeah, the desk. Why didn't I think of that? Sure. Wait a minute. I gotta get hold of myself. I gotta think. The cabinet, maybe. No, she's hidden it. Yeah, behind a picture. Under the rugs. In the sofa, the medicine chest, in the bedroom. It's got to be somewhere. I know it's here. I know it. No, no, it isn't here. Nowhere else to look. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. The bet didn't pay off, did it, Tom? You start out the door now, and then suddenly turn to take one last look. Nothing must appear disturbed. The lights from a distant automobile illuminate the room for a second, just as your eyes fall on the dressing table, and your heart almost stops. You nearly put the noose around your own neck, didn't you, Tom? There, on top of the dresser, in plain sight, is the sleeping tablet. Hazel didn't take it. Quickly, you walk to the bathroom, fill a glass half full of water, put her fingerprints on it, and set it on the nightstand. Then you walk into the bathroom and get rid of the tablet. At least they won't get you for the murder. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question. What would you think of a driver who deliberately did something that would clog up his motor with six times as much carbon and wear out his cylinders 50% faster than necessary? Well, friends, that's just what every driver is doing who's still using straight oil in his motor. Now, here's what I mean. In exhaustive road and laboratory tests, today's finest straight motor oil was compared with the amazing new type signal lubricant that combines five scientific compounds with 100% pure paraffin base. Signal Premium Motor Oil. The result? The motors using Signal Premium Oil actually showed only one-sixth as much carbon and one-third less cylinder wear. Get that? Motors stayed six times cleaner. Cylinder wear was reduced one-third with new Signal Premium Motor Oil. No wonder drivers who want to keep wear down and performance up are switching from old-fashioned straight motor oil. Switching now to the amazing new type signal lubricant that's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. The next day, the Casa del Rey is in an uproar. But you're ready for it, aren't you, Tom? 
The sheriff is suspicious, of course. Two deaths in as many days add up to more than a coincidence to him. He asks careful questions, and you give him careful answers. You tell him what you heard Dr. Latham tell Mrs. Symington about the sleeping tablet. How she laughed at his warning that they were extremely dangerous, possibly even fatal. The sheriff is quite interested in that, isn't he? A few minutes after he leaves to question the doctor, your telephone rings. Yes? Braden, this is Latham. The coroner and I have just finished examining Mrs. Symington. Oh? No marks of violence, no signs of poison. She died of a heart attack. You told him about the sleeping tablets? Of course. No reason to conceal it. You'll substantiate my story that I gave them to her under protest, of course. What are you worried about? I won't mention the note if you won't say anything about my owing her money. I wasn't worried about the note. I'm sure she would have renewed it today. That's just it. She was going to tear it up. What? What are you talking about? She called her lawyer in New York. Yeah, I'll have to call you back. Summon at the door. Tear it up. Tear it up. She was going to tear it up a half million. Uh, Mr. Braden. Huh? Oh. Well, what do you want? I'm from the DA's office. Yeah? You're under arrest, Mr. Braden. Suspicion of murder. What are you talking about? She died of a heart attack. The murder of John Warren. You're crazy. That was an accident. Maybe. But we received a letter from Mrs. Symington this morning. She mailed it last night. Letter? It seems she was afraid for her life. Looks like she wasn't far wrong. What do you mean? It was marked to be only opened only in case of my death. It was an affidavit, Mr. Braden. She swears she saw you turn on the gas in John Warren's cabana. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Gerald Moore and Myra Marsh. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Bill Tobin, music by Wilbur Hatch is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.